Greek expansion. Greece started to emerge from the Dark Ages in the 8th century BCE. As the population grew and more land and crops were needed, the Greeks started to set up colonies in southern Italy, Sicily, and along the shores of the Black Sea. At this time, Greek culture became influenced by designs from the East. The Greek geometric patterns were replaced by designs such as griffins and sphinxes from Egypt and Syria. The Greek cities of Corinth, Rhodes, and Ephesus were well-placed for trade with the East and became very wealthy. Golden Griffins These gold griffin heads found on the island of Rhodes were once part of a pair of earrings. Fond Farewell This detail is from a pot painted in the Greek geometric style, a style based on geometric patterns. The figures, painted in silhouette, are rather rigid. Fans Frog At this time, the Greeks were very interested in Egyptian art. This man is holding a jar with a frog on top. Frogs were sacred animals in Egypt. The object is made of fans, a greenish material often used to make Egyptian ornaments. Lion Pot This Arabalus perfume pot has a spout shaped like a lion's head. It has three painted scenes showing a warrior procession, a horse race, and dogs chasing hares. The lion's mouth would have been filled with wax to stop the perfume from evaporating. Exotic Exports Many decorated perfume pots were made in the town of Corinth and exported all over the Greek world. The winged figure on this pot may represent a god of the wind. Greek Colonization New colonies were founded between 750 BCE and 550 BCE, usually in places with good harbors and rich soil. These colonies soon became independent of their mother cities in Greece. Prickly Perfume This Arabellus, in the form of a hedgehog, was found in a Greek trading colony at Necrotus in the Nile Delta. Grooming These four geometric style clay horses form the handle of a lid of a pyxix, a pot in which women kept their cosmetics and combs. City of Athens. Athens was the most powerful city-state in ancient Greece. It was also the center of arts and learning. Its patron, Athena, was the goddess of wisdom and warfare. In 480 BCE, the Persians attacked Athens and destroyed its temples on the Acropolis. After the Greeks finally defeated the Persians, pages 54 to 55, Pericles, the leader of Athens, pages 18 and 19, began to rebuild the city. The Athenians lived on the land below the Acropolis and many fine buildings have been found by the marketplace, Agora. Nearby was Athens port, the Piraeus. Access to the sea was one of the main reasons for Athens. The Acropolis. In early times, the Acropolis high city was a fortified citadel. Later, it became the most sacred part of Athens. Sacred Statue. The dress shown in this frieze was for a sacred wooden statue of Athena that stood on the Acropolis. The dress is a woven peplos. Page 42. Temple of Erechtheon. The Erechtheon probably housed the wooden statue of Athena. Marble statues of women, caryatids, hold up the roof of its famous porch. The Parthenon Frieze. The marble frieze went around all four sides of the temple and was set up high on the outside of central chambers. Its main subject was the procession of worshippers who walked from the Agora to the Acropolis. Every four years as part of the Greek Panathenaea festival in honor of Athena. The Parthenon. The temple of the Parthenon was dedicated to Athena and stood at the highest point of the Acropolis. The Parthenon, which still exists today, was built between 447 to 432 BCE. Its decorative sculptures were designed by Phaedius. Golden Goddess. Inside the Parthenon stood a huge gold and ivory statue of Athena, the goddess of warfare. In this replica, she wears her aegis, a small goatskin cloak fringed with snakes, and a high-crested helmet. On her right hand is a small winged figure of Nike, the goddess of victory. An Athenian coin showing an owl, the bird of Athena. The Elgin Marbles. Many of the sculptures from the Parthenon were brought to England by Lord Elgin, a British ambassador to the Ottoman court. They can be seen today in the British Museum. Temporary Elgin Room at the British Museum painted by A. Archer. Young men on horseback take up much of the frieze. Some are trotting gently along and others are galloping with their cloaks flying out behind them. The background was originally painted, probably a bright blue. The horses used to have bridles made of bronze, but these have not survived. Politics in Athens. In early times, Greece was ruled by rich landlords called tyrants. 
They were eventually driven out and a new form of government called democracy, ruled by the people, was invented in Athens. Political meetings took place at the assembly on the Nix Hill, where Athenian citizens could vote and make speeches. At least 6,000 people had to be present for a meeting to take place. There was also a higher council of 500 members which met in a round building called the Pholos. Decisions about the city's defense were made by a group of 10 military commanders called Stratagoi. These were elected annually and could be re-elected many times. Solon. Solon was a lawgiver who lived in Athens between 640 to 558 BCE. He passed new laws to prevent poor Athenian farmers from being sold into slavery when they were unable to pay their debts. Pericles. Athenian statesman Pericles was elected Stratagos every year from 443 to 429 BCE. He reorganized the building of Athens after its destruction during the Persian Wars, 490s and 480s BCE. Boot Boy. This bronze figure is of an African boy holding a shoe. Athenian society depended on slaves. Some were employed in wealthy Greek homes while others worked in the silver mines in Attica. A few slaves received wages and were able to buy back their freedom, but most led lives of drudgery. Palace of Westminster. The democratic system invented in Athens has inspired many modern governments. The Greek word democracy means power of the people. However, in Athens, only free male citizens had the right to vote. Treasury of Triumph The Battle of Marathon was a famous victory by the Greeks over the Persians in 490 BCE. This fine marble building was erected at Delphi as a symbol of Athenian triumph. It was both a treasury full of objects taken from the Persians and a religious offering to the god Apollo. It stands by the sacred way which winds up to Abalo's temple. The treasury illustrates the close links between religion and politics in ancient Greece. Themistocles. This coin shows Themistocles, an Athenian leader who created the fleet that destroyed the Persians at the Battle of Salamis in 480 BCE, page 54. He was later banished from Athens. It is rare to find Greek inscriptions on bronze. Usually they were carved in stone. Judgment Tablet. This tablet contains a treaty between the cities of Oenthea and Chileon. They set up a legal process for solving disputes about land, with penalties if either side broke the treaty. The carved figures at the top represent democracy crowning the Athenian people. The decree is carved with the letters in a grid pattern, with no spaces between words, a style called Stoichedon. Law against tyranny. The inscription on this steely, upright stone slab outlines the Athenian law against tyranny. Introduced by Eucrates in 336 BCE, this law was one of several decrees passed by the assembly to protect democracy in Athens. Gods and Goddesses Religion played an important part in Greek life. The Greeks believed that all the gods were descendants of Gaia, the earth, and the Uranus, the sky. The gods had supernatural powers, but they also had human qualities. They fell in love, married, quarreled, and had children. Every god or goddess was responsible for a different area of life, and people worshipped the gods who would, they believed, then look after them. This worship took the form of building elaborate temples and sanctuaries, holding festivals, making animal sacrifices, and offering them the fruits of the harvest. Dionysus. Dionysus was the god of wine and the land's fertility. Zeus. Zeus, the king of the gods, is usually shown as a strong-bearded man. His symbol was a thunderbolt. Home of the gods. Mount Olympus is the highest mountain in Greece and was believed to be the home of the gods. Goddess of Love. This bronze head of Aphrodite comes from eastern Turkey. It was thought that the goddess was born from sea foam and carried by the Zephyrs, west winds to Cyprus. Beauty and the Beast. This mirror case shows Aphrodite, goddess of love and beauty, with her son Eros, shown here as a small winged boy. She is playing jacks, page 34 to 35, with Pan, who had the legs and ears of a goat. Brainchild. This vase painting shows the strange birth of Athena, daughter of Zeus, and the goddess Metis. Believing that any son born to Metis would be more powerful than his father, Zeus ate Metis. Athena emerged when Zeus ordered the god Hephaestus to cut open his head. Apollo and Daphne by Antonio del Paleolo, 1432-98 Daphne Daphne was a nymph loved by Apollo. He tried to seize her, but she escaped. Zeus later turned her into a laurel tree. Hephaestos Hephaestos, a blacksmith and the god of fire, made a special axe to cut open Zeus's head. He also made a throne and shield for the king of the gods. Apollo Beautiful Apollo was the twin brother of Artemis, the goddess of hunting. He had a famous shrine at Delphi and was the god of the light, healing, and medicine. Athena. 
Athena, the patron goddess of Athens, was also the goddess of wisdom and warfare. Her symbols were the owl and the olive tree, which she introduced to Athens. In the Trojan War, page 12 and 13, she fought on the side of the Greeks and helped Odysseus in his long voyage home. Grain goddesses. Demeter and Persephone were mother and daughter and the goddesses of grain. This caricata figure shows them sitting side by side. The Fawn. In this painting by the Italian artist Piero di Cosimo, 1462-1521, a woman lies dead, mourned by a fawn and a dog. Fawns were identified with the god Pan, who was the protector of shepherds and their flocks. Eros and Psyche. Greek myths were stories about gods and heroes, and there were many different versions of them in Greek history. This terracotta figure shows Eros, the god of love, kissing Psyche, the goddess of the soul. To the ancient Greeks, their embrace symbolized perfect happiness. Heracles. The great hero Heracles was the son of Zeus by a mortal woman. As a baby, Heracles strangled two snakes with his bare hands. In adult life, he performed 12 famous laborers' tasks for a king named Eurythesis. In the first task, Heracles killed a Nemean lion and is often shown wearing its skin. The vase painting on the left shows him killing the Symphalian birds. These birds destroyed crops and wounded people with their poisonous feathers. Heracles scared them with a bronze rattle given to him by Hephaestus page 21, and then shot them with a sling. Pegasus. This coin shows the winged horse Pegasus. Pegasus was tamed by Bellerophon, who tried to ride him to heaven. But Pegasus was stunned by a gadfly sent by Zeus and threw Bellerophon back down to earth. Too high. This bronze is of Icarus, who was given a pair of wings by his father. But he flew too close to the sun, and when the wax holding the wings melted, he fell in the sea and drowned. The building of the Argo. This Roman terracotta panel shows Jason, a prince from Thessaly, and the Argonauts, a group of heroes who sailed with him on a ship called the Argo. Jason and his crew set sail to find the golden fleece that hung on a tree guarded by a snake. The goddess Athena can be seen on the left helping the crew to build the ship. Lure of the Lyre Orpheus was a poet and a musician whose singing was famous for its soothing qualities. The magic of Orpheus's music is illustrated in this painting by Dutch painter Roland Savory, 1576-1639. to The wild animals are spellbound by the beautiful sound. Perseus and Medusa. Medusa was a gorgon whose gaze could turn a person to stone. On this vase painting of 460 BCE, the hero Perseus has just cut off Medusa's head and wrapped it in his bag. Festivals and Oracles. Every Greek city had its own calendar of festivals, during which people made sacrifices to the gods and held games in their honor. The rest of the year, the Greeks worshipped at small altars at home or in temples dedicated to the gods. One of the greatest temples was that of Apollo at Delphi. Apollo was a god of prophecy, and at Delphi he would reply to questions about the future. A priestess would act as his mouthpiece and make pronouncements that could be interpreted in different ways. These forecasts were known as the oracle. Come dancing. At this festival, a row of people holding hands approach an altar where a sacrifice is blazing. A priestess stands behind the altar with a flat basket used for winnowing grain. Holy Bull. Bulls were often offered as sacrifices. They were decorated with garlands of plants and ribbons to show that they had been set aside for the gods. Garlanded bulls' head inspired many of the decorative patterns on Greek temples. Lucky Ruins. This couple is at a Greek temple in ancient Poisidonia, Paestum, in southern Italy. Ancient ruins like these are believed to bring good luck to a new marriage. Center of the world. The Greeks believed that Delphi was the center of the world. They placed a huge stone there, the Omphalos, or navel of the world. This version has a network of woolen strands carved upon it, signifying that this was a holy object. The Charioteer. High above the Temple of Apollo was a stadium built for games and chariot races in honor of the god. Winning the chariot race was the greatest honor of the games, and the owner of the winning team paid for a statue to celebrate his success. This magnificent bronze statue has eyes inlaid with glass and stone, lips of copper, and a headband decorated with silver. The charioteer still holds the reins of his horses, which have long disappeared. Temple of Apollo Delphi was the site of the great temple of Apollo, home of the oracle. The remains of the sanctuary lie on the steep slopes of Mount Parnassus. One road up the slope is still lined with small buildings that used to store gifts offered to the gods. The Way to Athena the Panathenaic Way in Athens lead up to Athena's temple on the Acropolis. The road today passes the rebuilt version of a stoa, a long colonnaded building used as a business and meeting place. Sanctuary of Athena. The circular building stands in the center of the Sanctuary of Athena against a background of olive trees. Athena is said to have created the olive tree, and these groves still provide a rich harvest. Procession of Sacrifice. 
On this wide bowl used for wine, a line of people is on its way to worship the goddess Athena. The goddess is standing behind the altar where the flames are already rising. Everyone in the procession is carrying objects necessary for worship, such as cakes, wine, musical instruments, and a sacrificial bull. At home. The Greeks liked their homes to be private. Outer windows were small and set high in the walls, which were made out of sun-dried mud bricks. This farmhouse is a fairly simple building. Townhouses had more rooms and were probably more luxurious. All the rooms led off a central courtyard or garden. A statue of the god Hermes, a herm, was placed in the porch to prevent evil spirits from entering. Terracotta figurine shows a woman grinding grain to make bread. Wooden doors. Doors were precious objects because wood was expensive in Greece. The woman's quarters, Geneseum, housed the weaving looms, babies, cradles, and couches. Rain cat. Rainwater flowed from gutters through spouts like this one in the form of a lion's head. The dining room, Andron, where guests were entertained. Hearth for cooking to provide burning charcoal for portable braziers. Ladder to upper story. Altar where sacrifices were offered to the gods. Sitting pretty. In this vase painting, a young woman is sitting on a chair in her house. This elegant shape of chair is often seen on vases. On the tiles. Sometimes in wealthy houses, the ends of the terracotta roof tiles were decorated with human and animal faces. This gorgon head has tight curls and a protruding tongue. Walls made of mud bricks, sometimes plastered over. Roof made of clay tiles. Couches. Because Greek couches were made mainly of wood, none have survived. This bronze decoration was once attached to a couch near the headrest. Window openings without glass, but with wooden shutters. Wooden door with bronze fittings. Porch pillars made from fallen or cut down trees on the farmland. Stone foundations were often stolen by later builders. In the country, a stone wall usually surrounded the property. Women. The lives of women in ancient Greece were fairly restricted. They were very much under the control of their husbands, fathers, or brothers, and rarely took part in public life. Girls married young, at the age of 13 or 14. The main purpose of marriage was to have children, and a woman's status was greatly improved if she gave birth to a boy, page 32 and 33. Although legally they had very little freedom, some women could make important decisions about family life. Their spinning and weaving work also made an important contribution to the household. Greek woman by a British artist, Sir Lawrence Alma Tedima. Homemakers. Greek girls did not go to school. Page 32 and 33. Instead, they were taught how to look after the home. Some wealthy women did, however, learn to read and write. Whirl. Spindle. Wool was spun into yarn with a spindle. At one end is a weight known as a spindle whirl. The spindle twirls around and spins the wool fiber into thread. Spinning tools. This woman is using both a spindle and a distaff, a shaft with a spike at one end and a handle at the other. Well woman. In Athens, women and slave girls went to fill their water pots at public fountains, since few houses had their own private wells. The women waited in turn with their water pots balanced on their heads. This was a good opportunity to meet with friends and chat. This a pine tron shows women spinning and weaving. Thigh protector. To prepare the wool for spinning, a woman fitted an instrument called in a pine trine over her knee. She then rolled the wool across the surface of it and drew it out, creating thin skins of wool. Sappho. The poet Sappho lived on the island of Lesbos in the late 7th century BCE. Her poems give a rare glimpse of the lives and feelings of many women at the time. Entertainers. Respectable women were expected to stay at home, keeping house and supervising the slaves. Only women called hetari were allowed to attend the symposia, banquets, pages 36 and 37. Groups of hetari are often seen on vases playing the pipes, dancing and entertaining the male guests. The little lamps burning on the tables in front of the diners were used to light in darkened rooms. Beauty Aid Wealthy women owned many beauty aids. This bronze mirror, which would have been highly polished when new, has a stand in the form of a goddess holding a dove. Two little cupid figures fly on either side of her. Large numbers of caskets, combs, and perfume bottles have also been found at various sites. Growing up in Greece. At birth, the future of a baby rested in the hands of its father. If the baby was a girl or weak, or if the family could not afford to keep it, the father might decide to abandon it. Some abandoned babies were saved by other families and brought up as slaves. However, once a baby had been accepted by its family, he or she was treated kindly. Boys went to school at the age of seven. Girls stayed at home. At the age of 12 or 13, children were regarded as young adults and would dedicate their toys to the god Apollo and the goddess Artemis to show that they had reached the end of childhood. Potty training. 
This vase painting shows a little boy sitting in a potty, which also seems to double as a high chair. Modern baby sitting on an ancient potty. A bowl on a stand used in a marriage ceremony. Faster, faster. This painting from a wine pitcher shows two young boys pulling their friend in a go-kart. At the wine festival in Athens, pitchers were given as presents to boys when they reached the age of three to show that babyhood was over. Education. At school, boys learned reading, writing, and arithmetic from a teacher called Agramistes. Music was taught by a teacher known as Akitharistes. Boys also had to study poetry and the art of debating. Older boys might be taught by teachers called sophists who traveled from town to town and often taught their students in a gymnasium or training ground. Although girls did not go to school, some girls from wealthy families had private tutors. Wax Scratcher. Pupils wrote on wooden tablets covered in wax. Letters were formed in the softened wax with a stylus, usually made of bone or metal. Minder. Wealthy boys were taken to school by a slave called a pedagogus. Right. The boys' teacher left is reading from a papyrus scroll. The palestra at Olympia. Training for war. Physical exercise was important for all Greek boys as part of their training for warfare. They were taught track and field and wrestling by a teacher called a Peta tribes in the palestra. This was a low, low building with a colonnaded courtyard covered with sand. Man riding on goose. Man riding on horse. Clay company. Greek children often played with clay figurines. These riders were brightly painted and then placed in the graves of children to keep them company in the afterlife. Greek beauty. Beauty and cleanliness were very important to the ancient Greeks. In sculpture and on vases, both men and women can be seen posing gracefully in elegant draped garments pages 42 and 43. Young men had to keep themselves in shape to be good soldiers and athletes. Nudity was considered normal for young men who completed naked and athletic festivals, page 44 and 45. Women wore light, loose clothes made of finely spun wool and they perfumed their hair with oils. Wealthy women wore ornate jewelry, usually in gold and silver. Grave relief. On this grave relief, a slave is shown handing a bracelet to a woman, quite possibly the dead person herself. Agena earrings. This gold earring found on the island of Aegina was made of in Minoan times. Page 8 and 9. It shows two dogs standing on monkeys' heads enclosed by a snake. Follower of fashion. This terracotta figurine shows a fashionable Greek woman wearing a tunic and cloak, page 42 and 43, and holding a fan. Clothes are often brightly colored as they can be seen from the traces of paint on the statuette. Hairstyles were elaborate as shown on this woman who is wearing a head decoration. Powder pot. Women used a round, flat pot called a pyxis to hold their perfumes and cosmetics. Bath time. At the foot of this bathtub was a hollow where the water was deeper so that the woman could splash it backward over her body. Silver fibule. Headdress. Beautiful gold wreaths and sprays often decorated the heads of statues of gods and goddesses carried in processions at festivals. Elegant ears. Most earrings were made for pierced ears. These gold ones are shaped like little boats with cockle shells hanging from them. Ideal athlete. The statue is a Roman copy of a Greek bronze by the sculptor Polycletus. He was interested in the ideal proportions of the male body. At Olympia, there is a statue base that probably belonged to the original Greek figure, since the holes for the feet are exactly the right shape and size. The base is inscribed with the name of a young boxer named Kyniskos. Silver Medallion the silver medallion may once have decorated a bowl. It shows a girl offering a gift to the goddess Aphrodite. Around the medallion are a pair of silver brooches, fibulae, linked together by a long braided silver chain. This might have been used for fastening a cloak. Perfume pot. This brightly colored glass bottle was used for perfume. Scent made in Corinth and Rhodes was exported in the bottles to other countries. Well oiled. Here, one athlete rubs another's back with olive oil. The excess oil is removed with a body scraper. Getting dressed. Greek clothes were usually made from very fine wool or linen. Very wealthy people bought expensive silks from the East. Bright colors were popular, especially among women. Purple dyes came from sea snails and insect larvae. Other dyes were made from plants. The shapes of clothes were much the same for men and women and hardly changed over hundreds of years. The basic dress was a straight tunic fastened at the shoulder with pins and worn under a cloak. Lady Hamilton. Sir William Hamilton, British ambassador to Naples in the late 18th century, collected Greek antiquities. His wife, Emma, often dressed in Greek costume. Hairdressing. Greek women had long hair, which they piled up at the back of the head and held in place with a net and ribbons. Ornate hair decorations were worn on special occasions. 
ready to wear. The chitin was said to have been invented in the region of Ionia. It was made from a single rectangle of cloth, cut into two, and fastened at intervals from the neck to the elbows. It was then gathered at the waist with a belt. Another earlier kind of chitin, sometimes called a peplos, originated in mainland Greece. It was secured with big pins on the shoulders and did not have sleeves. Chitin. Chitin. Wrap up. Greek underwear was not fitted, but was wrapped around the body. This woman is pulling her chitin over her head. Greek fantasy. Sir Lawrence Alma Tadema, page 30 and 31, often chose Greek subjects for his paintings. The clothing and architecture are based more on his imagination than on historical fact. Menswear. This man is wearing a tunic, the chitin, and a cloak, the himation. His chitin has been pulled up over his belt. Workmen nearly always wore a very short chitin to give them greater freedom of movement. Younger men sometimes wore only the himation, which was draped over one shoulder and wrapped around the hips. Family group. Children wore shorter tunics so that they could run around easily. The Greeks went barefoot indoors and put on leather sandals when they went out. Sun protection. Outside, both men and women wore hats to protect themselves from the sun. Women thought a suntan was unattractive and would sometimes wear a veil called a kredimnon.